thanks for letting me speak English. Um, mein Deutsch ein bisschen komisch. My German is very weird, so um, better this way, I think. Otherwise, we wouldn't have much fun. Um, yeah, so I'm Stephanie Henke. I'm the co-founder of Tactical Tech, uh, an organization that we founded in 2003. Um, and today I'm going to talk about um, some of the work we've been doing on public engagement in arts institutions and cultural organizations all over the world. Um, and this is a kind of excerpt of what I'm going to talk about, but I'm going to try to talk a bit about the experiments we've been doing, where they come from, and then how we've been learning through talking about technology through both digital and analog means. So lots of um, in-person work that we do, um, the sort of usual and unusual spaces that we work in, and then some of this kind of method in the madness. So that was the title and a bit of a sneak preview of things that we're working on uh, next and a lot of images. Uh, so our work is very visual. So I thought I would share a lot of images uh, of the work. Um, so when we started uh, some of the work we've been doing on public engagement, we were very interested in the question of how technology is presented to us today. Um, we had a few different inspirations that we started with, and this was one of them. This is, uh, we were working on this in 2015, so for, uh, nine years ago uh, um, or so. Um, and this is an advert, for example, from um, the CompuServe magazine in 1982 that explains, uh, hopefully you can read a little bit of the text, but it's saying someday from the comfort of your home, you'll be able to shop and bank electronically, read instantly updated news wires, analyze the performance of a stock feed and so on and so on. And it's explaining the future we have now. Um, but we were really interested in the way it's presented. Everything's white, everything's clean, everything's perfect in, in the eyes of CompuServe. Um, and the second inspiration we were interested in, um, maybe some of you can guess what this is. It's somebody getting the first iPhone. And we were interested in this kind of euphoria or aspirational part of technology where people are, you know, that excited, uh, sleeping outside a shop all night to get the first iPhone. So where does this culture of technology come from? And lastly from this, which is probably recognizable to some of you, which is the kind of um, the way in which uh, the tech companies themselves choose to present themselves. This is a genius bar from an Apple store where you can see behind you know, John Lennon and Martin Luther King, these kind of figures being associated with what's essentially a computer. Um, so in doing that, we wanted to kind of play with all these mechanisms to help people think about technology in a more critical way, um, to think about things like where their data goes, uh, think questions like privacy and security, or habituation or misinformation, all these kind of different issues using this visual language. So we started a project that began here um, at the Hacker Bay uh, in 2016, called, it was called the White Room then, using this aesthetic you'll probably see from some of the images I shared for you. Um, and it was part of a larger project called Nervous, Nervous Systems that we co-curated there with Ansel Franco. Um, and after that, we realized in this experiment we did there that people were really interested in having a more critical conversation about technology in ways they could relate to. It's not very surprising now when I say that. I think you see it every time you open the newspaper. But I think in 2016, it was a little bit more uh, new. And we started doing that, but outside of conventional spaces. So we started, for example, taking over um, shops on high streets. Um, we did this um, in London, in New York, in San Francisco, where we took over really large uh, retail stores, like this one's, uh, the one on the left is in London, the one on the right is in San Francisco, which was in a former kind of Converse uh, shop, like Levi's shop. So it's a really big store on the high street. And people come in and they don't really know what they're gonna get. So they don't know, um, is it a new an Apple store? Is it something kind of, you know, um, promotion? They're not really sure, but it's an exhibition about the ways in which technologies are changing the way we live and everything there is not for sale, but rather kind of provocation. Um, these are kind of busy, lively spaces. As you can see, they're not kind of typical gallery spaces. You don't have to be quiet. You can touch things. There's lots of people there. Um, there are events there as well um, throughout the time. Um, and we're using a couple of different methods. So I'm going to show five things that we're using to talk about technology with the public. And I should say just like about the quantity of people, these shops are open for three weeks um, and we have like 20,000 people through in, in that time. So they're quite busy spaces. Um, so one of the things we're doing is talking about technology without using technology very often. Sometimes you go to an exhibition about technology and it's just full of screens and computers only. And we're really interested in how you can have a conversation about technology, what it means for society, politically, socially, 
um, without using tools. So we do obviously have some technologies there, but we're also um, finding lots of other ways. So for example, in this case, this is a, a kind of analog version of thinking about what, what, uh, what's called the Google empire here. So it's the ways in which Google um, has bought and acquired different kinds of businesses over time. People can look at the, the, the big, how big the company is. Um, the second technique we're using is this kind of seeing is believing. So rather than just telling people what to think about technology, we present them with how it works, normally behind the scenes, um, in a way that kind of gets them really fascinated, kind of interactive. Here's an example, again, analog. This example is um, an artwork called Forgot Your Password, which is um, this artist printed the sort of five, 6,000 passwords that were leaked on LinkedIn. And then people go through the books kind of looking for their passwords. Sometimes they find them. Um, and it always attracts a lot of people. And here's another one um, where it's more interactive, where people can actually see how facial recognition works and where that information comes from. Um, and that's, again, quite, it looks kind of maybe normal now, although most people probably still don't know exactly how it works, but this, again, was uh, some years ago. But the point is, how can we just open up technology, open this black box and help people see how it works in a way that's relevant and interesting to them? The third thing we're doing is we're usually using these kind of playful and provocative techniques. Uh, you know, talking about technology can seem interesting for the first few minutes, but gets very boring very quickly to a lot of people. So we try to find ways to make it more playful. Here's, for example, um, a slot machine where you can put, a, this was in the US, this version, so where you can put a dollar in and then you get instant followers up to 100 likes on Instagram. It actually works. Um, and people are kind of really curious about that. But obviously each of these pieces have a deeper set of questions about why do we put so much value on followers if we can just buy them from a slot machine. Um, so the ones I've been showing you right now, some of them are the artist works are things we've curated and some of the works that we create, we do both. So we both curate and we create artworks as well. Um, so yeah, the fourth technique we're using is making connections. So how can you really get people interested and involved in the questions? So here's um, some of the kind of more analog interactive techniques we're using where we're getting people to think about different ways that they can relate to the questions. So this one, for example, is a way you can map your own habituation to technology. So how many hours are you spending on your phone? That kind of thing. And people are assigned to map um, together which normally creates interesting arguments between couples as well um, when they're doing it. Um, and also kind of voting with their feet. So like asking people bigger questions, like what um, do you think about these issues and giving them space to participate and discuss at the end, either through events or just through this case, like simply um, voting with stickers in, in an exhibition we did. So those are some of the different things we're doing. And the last technique is someone to talk to and something to do. And I think that we, are really aware that some of the techniques we're using and some of the content is quite scary for some people, especially the more security, privacy oriented questions, or some of the questions are quite challenging in terms of how society sort of works on these issues. So we're always giving people a space to come with their questions, to talk to someone, to get advice, um, to, and these people who work in the, we call them data detox bar, are actually um, local. So we train local communities to, um, not only to be able to talk to people about what they're interested in when it's happening, but also to keep that expertise in that community when we leave uh, the space. So this is the kind of way we've been working. Um, and we and here's another example, sorry, the data detox bar. This is the detox bar at Berlin Fashion Week a few weeks, a few years ago. Um, so, so the thing we're doing is giving people as well things they can take away. This is the data detox kit. Because um, we find people, if they're activated by the questions, they normally leave asking, you know, what can I do? And we don't want to leave people with a sort of a blank space. So um, that's the story of the glass room and sort of like how we got into this uh, mechanisms and, and methodologies for working with people. And we, our team spends the whole time on the floor, on the shop floor with people, listening to people. And we found that like when, when we go through those exhibitions, we're usually listening to thousands of people what the questions are, what they, want to, what they want to talk about, what they're interested in. And if for us, it's a great way to learn what people are actually interested in. Because you always hear these uh, stories in the paper or uh, maybe even in research sometimes saying, this is what people do and don't care about. Um, but what we find when people come and talk to us is, is like that everybody has a reason to care about these issues. It's just that everybody's reason is kind of different, but people really want to talk about these things. 
So because of that, we got asked to kind of, uh, can we do this in other places? Obviously those big shops are fun to do, but exhausting and really expensive. So we found a way of doing that that isn't like that. Um, we found a way that's literally like, you can even put it on from an A4 printer in a school um, and started adapting it. And when doing that, we started putting lots of different venues. So adapting it into bigger, you know, for example, here in a bigger art space, um, here on a train station in Helsinki even, we'd had like a big poster display version of some of the glass room content. Um, and in lots, this is in a school uh, in South Sudan, lo in lots of different places where we've opened up the license for the work. So it's a creative commons license and said to people, what do you want to do with our, with our uh, way of teaching and way of learning about technology and how do you want to do it and let local groups interpret it in their own way. So like here's a group, here's a group down in the corner, for example, who's done it entirely um, as a uh, projected presentation, the projected exhibition. So very different ways depending on the country as well. And that's what we've been able to scale. So we've now done it in over 70 countries with over 500 partners. So in working this way, kind of trying to open up the work we've been doing, really supporting the work of others all over the world to kind of engage their communities in these questions and the questions that they care about. Um, from that, we've done two other things. We've kind of started exploring then in different directions. And one of the things we did um, a few years ago, just at the end of COVID, was we did an outdoor exhibition with Howe here in Berlin. Um, it was a kind of interesting experiment, which I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A, how difficult it is to do an outdoor exhibition. Don't necessarily recommend it. Uh, we spent most of the time fighting with the Berlin um, authorities and having a um, very lovely but very difficult to put up um, a balloon. We also decided to do it in a crazy way, which probably wasn't a good idea. Um, we spent a lot of time fighting with the wind, um, but we did put it on and it was kind of an interesting proposition to try and take this uh, to a different space. As you've probably seen, we're really interested in meeting people where they are, not necessarily in typical cultural spaces and reaching people that wouldn't necessarily come in through the door of a museum or, um, or a theater even, but might come across this. So we'd have people, you know, walking their dogs, cycling up, uh, you know, doing all kinds of things, just coming to the exhibition. With this particular exhibition was about techno-solutionism. So it's a little bit different than the glass room one I was showing you. It's more about the ways in which we re rely on technology to um, solve kind of as problems in the context of crisis. So I'm just gonna show you a very quick trailer. It's like two, a minute and a half to give you a sense of like the kind of artworks that we're showing and the kind of uh, language that we're using in this exhibition, which is a bit different than the one I was showing previously. <laughs> So you'll see that was a few years ago. So one of the things we're interested in as well is like working and then here we partnered with how across these kind of arts and performative spaces. Sorry, I'll just move that. So we don't want to just be in one kind of category or another. And we're often using education. We're using more pedagogical techniques. Then we're using more conceptual artworks and then working in a more performative way. So we like to mix these different things. Um, and the other thing we've been doing is taking that and, and starting to work with young people. And we have a project called What the Future Wants which is more provocative and more kind of um, uh, trying to meet young people where they are with these issues that they, um, sh they need to care about, but they is very much part of their existing environment and finding ways to work with young people that works for them. Um, so we're working with 13 to 19 year olds. Um, this is our exhibition we've just done, uh, we've just launched on AI, particularly for young people. 
Um, this again, you can put it up in a school or a library. We work a lot with libraries as well. Um, and this is where we're working with, we, we co-developed this with 300 young people. So we, we really felt we couldn't go and tell people, even though like I have a teenager, I think I understand 16 year olds and technology. I really don't. And we felt like we wanted to work with them. So we, we did this with a collaboration with 300 young people and, and hundred, um, educators. And then we've managed to roll that out as well in 29 countries. So we're starting to kind of, uh, get a bit more into this youth area. So I think I'm okay for time just to finish with a couple of uh, short, uh, yeah, checking. Um, maybe I was speaking too fast as well, not sure. Um, but I, I just maybe finished with a couple of things that we're working on next, uh, which might be interesting. Um, so I should, I keep saying we and I, but I'm just maybe should be clear. Uh, we're a team of 24 people with an office here in Berlin. We're very international. In fact, we have no majority. We're from all over the world, um, but we happen to be based here in Berlin. Um, and we have a studio. So through the studio, we're doing this uh, exhibitions and so on I just showed you, um, but also lots of different uh, collaborations with lots of different cultural institutions and organizations. Um, we just moved to Publix, who some of you might know. Uh, we've been involved in that for some time and that's just opened in Neukölln. There'll be a, also a sort of public space there for events. And that, that building in Neukölln is, is housing a lot of NGOs working on um, journalism and media. Um, so maybe I just show one little preview from a project because I want to wrap up and give time. Um, with just one I'll pull out is um, this one, um, which is uh, our citizen situation rooms that we're starting to launch now. So these are um, taking forward some of the work we've been doing with how do we learn how to interact with the public in, pub in uh, very public spaces like shops. Um, and we're going to be opening what we call open kitchen investigations, which are um, investigations that take place in collaboration with investigative groups like Corrective and others here in Germany and others in other countries where we do kind of like an open process of how we investigate issues and then allow the public in to see how that investigation goes and which is kind of a performative way of thinking about engaging the public in um, asking questions especially in a context in which um, communities are very divided and we have a very polarized set of opinions around key issues so we're trying to find ways through a combination of kind of design, art, performance, investigation, public spaces, where we can engage people in bigger questions that affect those communities. So that's something that we're going to be uh, launching in 2025. So the last thing is I've been asked to leave with a question, which I'm, I'm gonna do, um, because I think the question's coming to you, not the other way around, as far as I understand. So my, my final question really was about the question of impact, because one of the things we're interested in when thinking about change in this area is there's a lot of um, effort and emphasis going into research and understanding these issues, maybe even into policy work. Um, and we obviously are more on the public engagement side, and that's something maybe we have in common. Um, more interested in and more committed to how communities and citizens learn about these issues and so my question is really the second one there. So, you know, how do you think, and I'd be curious how other people think about public engagement and educational in interventions in the current context, and how do we think about um, impact and their connection to change? That's it, thank you.